At some point, we all face really confusing situations. And because of our experiences so far, we can't see what's really going on. Then all of a sudden, there is an encounter. Something crazy only God could explain. We have a light bulb moment, and we can finally see things clearly. These insights can significantly change our life direction. What if you could learn from somebody else's light bulb moment? My insight could be your insight. Significant life, God-inspired moments that can change a life. I have been asked to speak tonight on, uh, as part of the Significant Life series. Um, and uh, when I had that put forward to me, uh, that, you know, Darren, would you like to be part of the Significant Life series? I was like, yes, that sounds awesome, because speaking is not terrifying at all um, in front of people. It's really not. <laughs> and um, uh, no, but, but what I was actually thinking on the inside was, well, my story's not really that interesting. You know, I, I didn't feel that I had anything of value to share um, in the days after I was asked to speak. I was just had this kind of voice going inside my head, going this little conversation. Well, you could talk about that, oh, but it's not really relevant to anyone's life. And and I had these things going on um, in my in my head. So my life doesn't really have any significant moments. Was the main thing that was running through my head at the time, and that my story isn't very interesting. And these thoughts kept swimming around my head uh, for the next few weeks, and it wasn't until I um, started listening to the speakers prior to me on Sunday night and also on the Sunday mornings, um, because the Sunday mornings are doing the significant um, series as well, a significant theme series. And it wasn't until I heard them that, um, uh, sp them speaking about in particular the voices that we listen to, and then suddenly it kind of clicked, and I was thinking, what voice am I listening to in my head? Is it a, is it a positive, um, God-sent, affirming voice? Or is it a voice um, of doubt and of self-doubt in particular that, that I'm not worth listening to or that my story has no value for other people? And I realized that that was the voice that I was listening to, the voice of self-doubt. So I started writing this sermon and I got stuck on where to start. I wasn't sure where in my life I have kind of had my first significant moment. Um, so I thought I would start at the beginning, because that seems like a good place to start talking about your life. Uh, but before I get into it, I just want to um, open this in prayer and, and give it up to, to God. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to share. Um, you can take the most seemingly, um, I don't know, average life to that person and you can make such an extraordinary difference out of that for other people, God. And so I just thank you for all the speakers that have spoken before me and all the speakers who are going to speak after me, Father. I pray that you would bless them. And I pray that tonight in particular, that there would be something that would be taken from what I have to share, God, and it would, it would uh, permeate into people's hearts and people's souls, something they could take away and think about and wrestle with, God. But mainly, God, I just pray that you are blessed and praised tonight, for you are worthy of all that we have. So I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> if I possibly get some water, that would be wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> So I was born in Napier um, on the 1st of April, 1988, in the afternoon. Yeah, in the, oh, thank you, Grace. Wonderful. Yes, 1st of April, April Fool's baby. <laughs> it's not funny. I've heard it all before, um, but it was in the afternoon, so I'm off the hook for the April's first thing. If that doesn't really matter, though. People still tease me about it. <clears throat> um, my mother's name was Adrian Quinn, and as far as my father goes, um, he had not stuck around and probably didn't even know or doesn't know that I exist. I have two older half-brothers, one of whom was in and out of gangs, He's, they're both older than me, one of whom was in and out of gangs uh, for most of his teenage and some of his um, early 20s, or his 
his midlife, and um, my other brother uh, will just say that he lives a very interesting lifestyle um, and makes some rather interesting lifestyle choices. Um, so like I said, as far as I know, um, <clears throat> my father was a one-nighter kind of guy, and my mother um, suffered from a mental illness, which dictated that she had to have government help um, weekly checkups, so she had to have someone come and visit her, um, and weekly checkups to make sure that she was um, uh, eating healthy food, showering, uh, looking after herself, and not just herself, um, but also the three of us. So she was struggling to take care of herself, let alone um, three little ones running around the place. Um, we were all under eight um, at this stage. Um, and there were also drugs and a lot of men, as far as I know, in and out of the house. So all things considered, I was not off to the most fantastic start in life. Um, Adrian, my mother, did the best she could, but she struggled to look after herself, uh, let alone the three full-on boys. So the two youngest, myself and the next oldest brother, ended up bouncing around a few different family members, mainly my gran, our gran, and um, auntie. And so we were, we were going around their houses and spent a lot of time with them. So they were quite influential in those early years for me. Um, I was then placed into the foster system where I was taken in as a, um, I don't know what the term is, I don't want to say a test child, because <laughs> that sounds terrible, but basically on a trial basis to see um, whether the family who took me in would be willing to adopt me or not. So I was taken in by Brian and Shelley Porter. And as far as I was concerned, because I was only two or three at the time, um, these people were very different and a bit strange. They did some weird things, like they prayed before you ate. Who does that? You know, they, um, uh, before bed, they also read stories to me from the same book every night. And I was like, well, can we mix it up? No, I probably didn't think that. I was only three. It was really cool. Um, they, so they read me from, uh, read stories to me from this book. Um, and they were stories about um, floods wiping out the earth giants and young kids killing them with stones and hacking their heads off. Oh no, this was the kid version, so there wasn't the hacking that came later in the adult version. It's awesome, check it out, it's called the Bible. Do it. Um, huge fish that swallowed men whole and talking donkeys. Sounds like the Chronicles of Narnia almost, doesn't it? Now that I think about it. So they read these, the, these stories to me every night and it was a very strange environment to be in and yet I had never felt so loved in my life. I think up until that point, I had, I had just existed, I think. And not that my birth mother didn't love me. She did her best. But I, I don't remember much from before I, I came to be with Brian and Shelley. So, uh, and that's probably a good thing um, for me. Um, so I was adopted at age three and became Darren Porter. Whoop, whoop. Um, which I think is a better last name than Quinn, unless there's any Quinns out here. No offense. Um, <laughs> sorry. No, no, Quinn's awesome. I mean, oh, we're going to edit that part out. Um, I was then introduced to church. Um, God and this awesome sounding fellow, Jesus, who died on a cross so that if we would believe in him with all our hearts, we could go to heaven when we died. This was my interpretation at three to four years old. There was Jesus, he came, he died for us many, many years ago, and all we have to do is believe him and accept him into our hearts, and we could be with him forever. And this sounded pretty carpi to me. Pretty choice. Um, so when I was four, um, I asked mum if Jesus would mind coming and living in my heart. And she was like, yes. No, no, he wouldn't. Wait, she said, yes, he will. He will come and live. Confusing my words. So we knelt down there at the side of the bed and we prayed. And I just prayed the simple prayer. And I still remember it, actually. I said, dear Jesus, please come and live in my heart. Amen. And, and for me, that was it. And from then on, I considered myself a Christian, which was really, really cool. And so after that, it's been pretty smooth sailing. 
No bumps, no nothing. Christian life is just one big party. I hear some laughter. Yeah, no, you're right. It it wasn't even close um, to one big party. So uh, when I was about seven, we moved to Tauranga. Um, uh, we We had a new house, a new school, and a whole new church. And this was huge for me. Because we had, you know, the house, the church, the friends that I'd grown up with in the church. And then all of a sudden, boom, new city, didn't know anyone. My parents knew some people, but I didn't know anyone. Um, uh, But fortunately for me, I was a rather out there kind of kid. And I would just go and sit with other families and start talking to them and their kids. And so it didn't take long for me to make new friends um, and to start building a, a life for myself. Um, It was at this church that we started to do um, Totra Spring Church Retreats, which was really cool. Um, The church was called Tauranga Christian Fellowship at the time. Now it's Life Church down by the Girls' College. Um, And it was at one of the Totra Springs church camps that I had uh, my first two memorable aha moments, those light bulb moments from God. So the first, the first time, and these were about a year apart, so they were at two separate camps. So the first one was um, we showed up at this camp, and there was this awesome guy who, who spoke to the kids because the adults had um, their meeting, and the kids all went off and did really cool stuff, arts and crafts and sang songs and danced around and generally got like high on lollies and stuff. It was awesome. And this guy, I can't remember his name, but he was just amazing. I remember just being like, I want to be like you when I grow up. You're awesome. He was ridiculous and funny. And then he did the strangest thing. He stood up and he started speaking, but it wasn't English. It was just this like, <laughs> and I, well, that's what it seemed like to me. Eh? And we were just like, what? <laughs> um, and then he goes, does anyone know what that was? And we were all like, nope. Except for the one smart kid who was like, he's speaking in tongues. He's speaking in tongues, everyone. I can do that. And I kind of sat there going, if he can do it and you can do it, I want to do it. Because it sounds cool. I have my own secret language. And so he explained what the gifts of tongues were. And to us, anyway, he explained that it was, it was our, um, if God would allow it, it was our personal um, language with God. And that it was our spirit um, communicating with God. And I was like, wow, that sounds so cool. And so he taught us, which sounds weird because I've heard a lot of people, you know, let, we'll, we'll pray for the gift of tongues for you if you don't have the gift of tongues. But he said, he took a whole different approach and he said, I am going to teach you how to speak in tongues. And we were like, yes, awesome. And he proceeded to say something along the lines of, um, should have bought a bigger digger. And we were like, what? And he said, I'll slow it down. I should have bought a bigger digger. And we were like, okay. And he said, so let's start off slow. Should have bought a bigger digger. 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 And he said, okay, that's good. And he goes, now say, bought a Honda, should have bought a Yamaha. (laughs) So we did that over again. Should have bought a bigger digger, bought a Honda, should have bought a Yamaha. And we said over and over and over again. And we were laughing. We thought it was hilarious. And we were, we were laughing away, and then all of a sudden, he just said, God, move. And I would say about half of us, myself included, just started shooting off a whole lot of other words. And I was just like, whoop, closed my mouth. And it gave me a big fright because I was having fun. And I didn't expect this other language to come out of my mouth. Um, and afterwards, I came up to him, totally freaked out. And he was like, don't worry, a lot of people get freaked out when this happens. And he said, look, it's just that God wants to have um, this, this language with you so that you can speak to him. So that in times where you don't know what to say, you don't know what to pray, even when you're scared or excited and you just don't know what to do, that you can say and speak like this to him. He said, but you need to practice it and you need to, <clears throat> and you need to keep using it. He said, not that God will take it away. But it's just like anything else. You need to keep it up, just like your Bible reading and just like praying. And the aha moment that came for me in that time was that was the first time that God existed to me. That was the first time I remember thinking God uh, is choosing 
to give something to me. Now, I look back and um, God gave me this amazing family and, and, and himself and his son. But this was the first time I had actually received something that I could kind of tangibly or verbally use. And I was just super excited. So that was the light bulb moment number one in my life, that God exists and he cares enough to give something to me that I want. He is a good father and he wants to share stuff with me. And he is a good father and he wants to share things with you. And all we have to do is step out in faith and say things like, should have bought a Or, God, I, need, I just need your help with the finances. We, we want, really want this house, God. And if it's your will, give it to us. Or whatever it is that you desire, um, be it in God's will, he will provide. But he wants to be with you and he wants to give things to you because he loves you. So that was my first light bulb moment. God cares about me and he wants to give stuff to me, which is wicked for, for like a, a seven or eight year old kid for God to just want to give stuff to me. Um, a year later, we went to the same camp, and it was a different guy. And this time, we just had this music playing, the soft music, and I felt like I was going to fall asleep because it was really calm and really peaceful. And he, this man came up to me, and he said, he said, would you like to meet Jesus? And I said, I already know Jesus. I accepted him into my life when I was four, and I've already met him. He gave me the gift of tongues last year. And he said, that's wicked. That's awesome. He didn't say wicked. That's awesome. But would you like to meet Jesus? And I thought, yeah, I would love to meet Jesus. That, that would be really cool. And so I said, I just want to pray because I just really feel that, that Jesus wants to meet with you right now. And I was a bit kind of skeptical because I was like, okay, well, Nothing really has ever happened apart from the tongues when I've prayed for it. And so he just said, God, I just pray that you would reveal your... And I was out. I don't remember the end of his prayer, but I remember his words, that you would reveal your... And that was it. And I kind of woke up, and I wasn't in the room um, where I'd been um, prior with all the other children. I was in a, in a dark... It was a big oval room, and there was a man just standing in the corner of the oval room. And he was just there, just wearing normal clothes, adult clothes, I call them, just wearing adult clothes. And I went up to him and I, and I said, where am I? <laughs> and he goes, oh, it's okay, you're safe. And I felt so safe. Like I just, and I didn't know who this person was and I didn't know where I was, but he just said, you're safe. And I said, okay, how do I get home? <laughs> because I don't really want to be here. This is weird. And he said, um, I just want you to walk through that door over there. And he said, um, and just afterwards, I want you to tell me about the person that you meet. And I said, okay. So I walked through the door, and as soon as I did, the air standing in front of me was this amazingly dressed person. Like, I don't know, the, the most amazing three-piece suit with this beautiful purple tie, the nice slipped back hair. Um, looked like, you know, like a James Bond style character. And he, and he just said, come here, come here. And so I went to talk to him. And I can't remember everything he said, but I just remember feeling very uncomfortable talking to this person. And he said, um, he said something along the lines of, you know, how are you doing? Um, and I said, I'm, I'm good. And he said, I just want you to remember me. I just want you to remember me. And I said, Okay. <laughs> And then he said, you can go back through the door. So I went back through the door. I met the man who was plainly dressed compared to the other guy. And all of a sudden, I felt safe again. And I said, who was that? And he said, that was the devil. And this feels really heavy to say. I've never really said it out loud before. But he, he said, that was the devil. And I thought, yeah, it was. And he said, what did you notice? And I said, I noticed that he was dressed really well. He had a really nice voice. He looked really handsome for a guy. And, <laughs> and, um, and everything about him was, when I think back now, everything about him was attractive and drawing and made you want to go to him. And yet, and, and this person said, okay, so all those things, but how did you feel? And I said, uncomfortable. And he said, I want you to remember 
that feeling. I want you to remember the feeling of uncomfortableness. And he said, you can go now if you'd like. And I said, well, can I ask you who you are? As a kid, I probably just said, who are you? <laughs> um, and, and he said, you know who I am. And that was it, and I woke up. And that was the next light bulb moment for me. At that time, I didn't really understand. But looking back, it's, it just blows my mind that that happened. And that Jesus, that, that was clearly Jesus now in hindsight. And how the light bulb moment for me in growing up, every time I look back at that moment, is that from a worldly point of view, Jesus is not an attractive uh, figure. People aren't um, just necessarily immediately drawn to Jesus because he is very, um, on, the, on the outside from a worldview, he's, he's quite um, plain, I suppose, but there is that gentle um, peace that was there. And I'll never forget that. And I'll also never forget um, the other character who was just totally appealing in every way and yet I felt uneasy. And the light bulb moment for me, looking back, is that um, whatever situation I find myself in and you find yourself in, Jesus, uh, a God moment or a God situation, when Jesus is there and when God is there, no matter how strange the situation is, you will feel that peace, that peace and love that transcends all understanding. And when you're drawn to something that is, uh, you know, appealing and the world is going for it and it's the, the, the suit and the tie and the slicked hair and the fun and the, the alcohol and all these things that just draw us, our, our sinful human nature, we are drawn to them. Um, and yet we know in the back of our mind, we know that something is not right. So for me, looking back, the light bulb moment is, or the thing that I want you to take away from this, is that whatever situation you find yourself in, you need to listen, as a Christian, you need to listen to the guiding of the Spirit. And you will always be guided and drawn towards the place of peace and security. And if you don't feel that in that situation, I would recommend or suggest that you're probably heading towards the suit and tie. And that's not really a place... Uh, that you want to head towards. So the, the plain and the ordinary um, on the outside is actually that, that safe place where, where Jesus is and he wants to draw you in. So those were the, the two um, light bulb moments from my younger years. Um, where am I? Da -da 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 -da. Okay, so moving on. I carried on through school and ended up at Tauranga Boys College. Woo! Nope, no one. Okay. Bethlehem College? There you are. Yeah, well. Um, these years, <laughs> these years uh, were very difficult for me. I struggled with stealing, swearing, lying, pornography, uh, and with pornography especially becoming accessible in a way that it hadn't been when I was, uh, you know, 11 and 12, with the internet kind of really kicking off around the time I was 13, 14, and just kind of exploding, that kind of stuff became so readily available. Um, and uh, it became accessible in a way it hadn't before, and I had to balance all these extracurricular activities, so the stealing and the swearing and the lying and all these things, I had to balance those activities with being a worship leader in church on a Sunday and a Wednesday night, and that's no easy task to live the dual lives. Um, it's not easy at all. I even wrote ha ha here because I'm supposed to laugh. Ha <laughs> ha. I don't know. Um, and then girls became a big part of my life. Um, I hadn't really noticed them before because girl germs, ooh. Um, and then one day, wham, hello, ladies. Uh, and this started, it was creepy. This started my later teenage years and early 20s of being a very naughty chap. Um, now, I just want to stop and share the next aha moment as I look back. Um, next aha moment I've had from God. And this is like a hindsight aha moment. Um, uh, so I'm sharing this more, and I, I touched a bit on this in my previous talk, which was on adultery. Um, but this is aimed towards the gentlemen um, out there. And this is something that 
never got shared with me, and I really wish it had. And I'm going to keep it short and really to the point. And I, it, it's not supposed to come across as a growling or like a whoosh, but it's something that I wish I had heard um, when I was going through my teen years. So this is to all the young guys out there who might be playing the field or might be considering playing the field. And that is this. As I dwelt on writing this message, the thing that came to me here was that she is not yours. Okay, Or for the girls, he is not yours. They don't belong to you. They're not yours to treat however you want. They're not yours to do with whatever you want. They don't belong to you. They belong to God. They are a daughter of the living God, and he cares so much, and his heart breaks. Gentlemen, his heart breaks when we, when we take advantage, when we go too far. Um, and it's not to... This is not to make us feel bad, but guys, it's often us. We often push, um, and, and we're often the ones that take it too far, and the girls respond because they think that showing affection will be um, a way that they will be loved. So giving back physically means that he loves me. This is not the case at all. So she is not yours. Um, not until the day you get married does becoming does she become accessible to you sexually or vice versa he become accessible to you sexually um, I was so consumed by making myself feel good and satisfying my own sinful desires that I didn't stop and think what I was doing to these girls the decisions I was making and how they were affecting um, the other people I was grieving God the father by taking advantage of his daughters his daughters God had a plan for these women and me fooling around and messing around with them was absolutely not part of that plan. So my next aha moment is not so much a, a light bulb because it seems obvious, but I really felt that I had to share that tonight for the young guys, uh, even for the older guys, um, and also for the ladies um, who, who may be in that boat as well. So they are not yours, they belong to God. But I didn't really understand all this at the time, so I carried on the way I was going. And it is only by the grace of God that he saw fit to place my beautiful wife, Tina, in my life. Woohoo! How you doing? Good. Because you said so earlier. Um, she <laughs> don't know where this is going. Um, we've been married now for five and a bit years. Woo! Woo! Okay, come back when it's 20 years, um, and I will. <laughs> um, it has not been plain sailing at all in our marriage. There have been, don't get me wrong, there have been like fantastic times, but we've also really struggled. We've had our struggles and issues, but we move forward together, um, knowing that God has a plan, um, and that if we rely on Him, He will get us through everything and anything as long as we press into each other, and through that we rely totally on God. So we have now arrived at what can only be described as my biggest aha light bulb moment, God moment to date. And this came um, actually about two weeks ago. So this was like, it was like, I was like, what's my latest aha moment? And this came to me two weeks ago when I was talking to my parents. Um, Tina and I were over at their house. And Dad mentioned... Romans 8 verse 1, because I was talking about, you know, like, oh, there are some young guys in my small group who um, who brought up the point of, oh, you know, how can a God who is perfect love sinners, you know, love people who continually stuff up again and again and again? And I thought, that's a really great question. And I don't totally know the answer. I have a fair idea, but I don't know God's mind and how he is just so amazing. Um, with the grace that he pours out. And then Dad said, oh, try Romans 8, verse 1 to 4. But Romans 8 in particular, and it says this. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I was like, wow. When I read that, I'd, I've read it before, and it's just been a passing verse. And this time I read it, therefore there is now no condemnation condemnation, no judgment, no criticism for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Um, and, and when I read this recently, God just, he just totally revealed the full weight of that verse to me. And it was just like a ton of bricks. I was like, oh, and I almost started crying because I was like, that is just the perfect answer. <laughs> that, that is the answer right there. The answer to all our questions in the Bible, believe it or not. It's great. You see, I, like many of you, I'm sure, have struggled and wrestled with how a perfect God could love someone who continually sins. I couldn't grasp how a perfect God could love someone who asks for forgiveness on a Tuesday for something they've done wrong, and then on the Wednesday, they do that same thing wrong, and the Thursday, they do the same thing wrong, and then you're on your knees going, God, I'm just, oh, I'm so bad. Why am I like this? I, I pray that you would come take this from me. Help me to focus more on you, um, to listen to you, to your guiding. I don't want to be like this. And the next day, boom, it happens again. And oh my goodness. And it just feels like this never-ending cycle of sin, repent, feeling of forgiveness, sin, repent, forgiveness, sin, repent, forgiveness. And it just seems to go on and on. And I, I couldn't understand until I read this verse um, that, uh, that a loving God could actually forgive and forgive and forgive. Surely God must reach a point of, that's enough. You've had enough chances. You've blown all two billion of them. And you're only 28. That's it. You're cut off. You're done. No more grace for you. But here is the truth. And it's the biggest light bulb moment of my life. When Jesus became flesh, lived a perfect life, and died blameless on the cross, all my sins and all your sins, from the moment of our birth to the moment of our passing, were in the future for him. So I'll say that again. All the sins from the moment we are born to the moment that we die, all of those sins, when Jesus was on the cross dying for those, taking the full weight of God's wrath for us, for what we deserve, all those sins that we were going to commit were in the future for him. And when I came to that realization, it totally changed my way of viewing, sounds bad, my sinful nature and my sinful life and, the, and, and who I am and striving to be like Jesus. So this means he knew and knows every sin that I would ever commit in my life, and yet he still died for me. He knows the sins I'm going to commit tomorrow, and the next day, and the next week, and the next month, and the next year, and for the rest of my life. And he didn't say, oh, I'm going to forgive you till you're about 35, and then I can't take anymore. That's, whoa, that's intense. He didn't do that, no. He saw everything that we have done, are doing, and are going to do for all of our lives, and he died for those sins. I just want you to think about that for a second. That's a huge weight, a huge thing for Jesus to have taken on himself, even just one person's sin, that we were supposed to be punished. We were the ones who deserved the death on the cross and the beating, and yet Jesus said, no, I want to take Darren's sin and everything he's going to do, and not just Darren's sin, but everyone he's going to talk to on that Sunday night, everyone he's going to meet, everyone he's not going to meet, and all they have to do is accept me as their Lord and Savior. That is huge. It is massive. And if that doesn't just confirm deep in your spirit who Jesus is and the love and the grace that Jesus has I, I don't know what will. It just blows my mind. John 3.16 says, and this is the Darren version, For God so loved you and me that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not die, would not be punished, but would have eternal life. And it says in Galatians that we are saved by grace. Are we are saved by grace and good works? No. Are we saved by grace and all the people that we convert along our Christian life and journey? No. Are we saved by grace and all the fantastic things, the charities, the money we give away, the, the people we pray for? No. We are saved by grace and grace alone. <laughs> and that's it. 
it sounds so simple. And yet we can complicate it so much by overthinking it. But that is the truth. We are saved by grace and grace alone. And it is done. It's happened. It's, it's already happened. And all we have to do is accept Jesus and say, yes, Jesus, I want you in my life. I am a sinner. I am a sinful person. I, I do things. I want to live a Christ-like life. But you have to accept that in your striving to be Christ-like, you will fail. You will fall. And you will stumble. But, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what does this mean for us moving forward? Does it mean that we can accept Jesus into our lives and then just go and do whatever we want because we are forgiven? And I've heard that before. Well, I'm saved by grace and grace alone. I've accepted God. I can just continue sinning. And when I die, it's going to be pie in the sky. And I wrestled with that a few years ago. And I thought, it kind of sounds right. Because if we're saved by grace and grace alone, I accept God, then all my sins are forgiven. Even the ones I don't know I'm going to commit. So I might as well not try to not do them, if that makes sense. But there is more to the verse in Romans. So it starts off, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That sounds pretty awesome to me. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He sent his own son in the form of man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. And this is the part that answers that previous question. Can I just do whatever I want? Right here. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So we are called to live according to the Spirit and not the flesh, which is our sinful nature. Does this mean we will never muck up? No, of course not. But we are called to be Christ-like and to submit to the leading and the prompting of the Spirit. Folks, it's not easy to live a good Christian life. And the truth is, it's really difficult to go against the grain of the world. But remember this, no matter how many times you stumble and fall in your journey with God, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for every one of your stumbles because he loves you that much. That's just amazing. And all he asks, all he asks in return is that you believe that Jesus is Lord and you trust him with everything that you have. That has got to be the sweetest deal ever. That's just wicked. Woo! Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no guilt, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are not condemned to sin, uh, to sin and death and guilt, but are lifted up through faith in Jesus Christ and elevated to a place of sonship or daughtership of the Most High God, Yahweh. And to end tonight, folks, I just want to play, uh, we're going to have a song that's going to play. Um, and a good friend of mine um, passed away on um, Thursday. And I went home and I just, I didn't feel anything. I didn't know what to do. And so I thought, I'll just go and do the dishes and I decided to play some music, and this song came on. And um, my mother-in-law had been playing it during the week, and it had stopped right at the start of this song. And as soon as I heard it, I just broke down, because this was the first song I ever remember hearing when I uh, went for my first car ride with this young guy, Dan McQueen. And after I kind of got over the emotion of the song, I just felt that God said, I want you to share this song on Sunday night. The song is called Voice of Truth um, by Casting Crowns. And I feel that the lyrics in this song, there are people here tonight 
who, who need to understand the lyrics in this song. Because you may be listening to those voices of doubt like I was a few weeks ago. Or the voice that says, you're not good enough. You can't do this. You can't do that. You're not significant. Nothing you are going to do will ever amount to anything in the long run. So why bother? But I want to encourage you and remind you that that is the voice of the man in the suit. And that is not the voice of Jesus. That is not the voice of truth. I believe the voice of truth tonight is saying, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the voice of truth. The voice of truth says that you are forgiven. You are redeemed. You are set free. From the moment that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your sins, past, present, and future were forgiven. That doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want. But that does mean that we can lift that weight of burden off our shoulders. And that we can walk out of here free in the knowledge that we are no longer slaves to sin. But that we are free in Jesus. And through Jesus, we are going to have an eternal relationship with God the Father. That is the truth and that is the voice that you need to listen to tonight I'm just going to pray and and that will end the service tonight but um, uh, Monica and myself we're going to be down the front if anyone would like any prayer afterwards um, feel free to go to the cafe and talk but remember that you are free and you are so incredibly and amazingly and gracefully, abundantly, more than you will ever know, loved by God. And that just, that just rocks my world. <sighs> Gracious Father, you are more than enough for us. We don't deserve even the tiniest portion of your grace and love. And yet you lavish it upon us. You just soak us in your love and your grace. You pour it out abundantly and endlessly upon us. And in that knowledge, God, as we leave here tonight, in our conversations, in our workplaces, in our schools, and everywhere that we go, our prayer is that you would Uh, permeate through us that that knowledge, the voice of truth, the knowledge that we are no longer condemned, we are no longer slaves, but we are free, that would just, the excitement of that would just burst out from us, God, and that people would just be overwhelmed by our joy and happiness, that we are loved by the creator of the entire universe, the creator of men and angels chose to set us free from our sinful ways so that we could come into right relationship with Him. God, that is just amazing. There aren't any words, God. So bury that truth, plant that seed so deep within us and allow it to take root so that we might go from here and allow that seed to grow and to um, burst forth into life. And allow us to have the confidence to know that even if we stumble, even if we fall, that we are absolutely 100% worth it because you've already died for it. You already sent your son to cover it for us, God. And we want to continue to strive to be Christ-like and to be spirit-led, God. Lead us by your spirit. Take us by the hand drag us kicking and screaming sometimes, Father, if that's what it takes. But God, we choose now to be led by you so that you can have your way in us and through us. As Monica says, Father, have your way, have your way, have your way, for you are the voice of truth. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen.
Thanks for coming out tonight, friends.